Welcome. I'm Kelly Rodman from Dreamtown Realty. I'm a residential specialist and I'm so happy you're here today because we're going to be talking about inspections and appraisals. Those two areas are always enshrouded in mystery. So we hope to kind of D to crack the code today from two of our experts. We have Jamie Dunsing from Dunsing Inspections and we have Michael Walsh from Citywide Appraisals. Thanks so much again, and let's start the show. Hi, my name is Jenna Dunsing with Dunsing Inspections. We're a family-owned real estate company um, providing professional, ethical, educational inspections to anybody in the real estate buying process. I've been there for about three years now. We've been in business for the past 43 years. Um, the company was started back in 1980 by my grandmother. My parents are now co-owners, and then me and my brother are third generation. We have our inspectors from Danzing uh, Inspection. And uh, we're going to talk about today, we have uh, some presentation at the appraisal. I can email it to you the appraisal uh, information. And the inspection people are going to talk about home inspection. I believe the whole idea over here was to actually talk about the two things that you, because most of the time most buyers, what they do is they know what's going on when in terms of getting the loan and the real estate, etc. But then you have the stuff that goes behind the scenes, which is the appraisal and the inspection report, which is two reports that are required every time you do you buy a home okay and that's what we're going to talk about take it away guys we're located up in lake bluff illinois uh, we cover really the whole chicago area we have uh, 10 inspectors with our company right now um, and as i say we kind of cover the whole chicago area congratulations to you guys for uh, being here and making the decision to purchase real estate um, my goal is to kind of explain a little bit about the process and sort of give you some of the some ideas on what the pitfalls that you want to avoid um, when purchasing home. Really, from just sort of what I would say the nuts and bolts portion. I'm not going to get into any sort of financing and costs and that kind of stuff, but uh, give you a few ideas on that. So, um, as far as our company goes, um, we do primarily home inspections, but over the last probably 15 years, home inspections have evolved into including a lot of ancillary services as well. So in addition to that, there may be some environmental tests that you want to have done. Um, radon testing is very common. Um, mold testing has become very common. That's something that we do on a very regular basis. Uh, and then indoor air quality, just in general, to know are we breathing safe air in your house. Um, some of the other services that we're starting to do now are sewer surveys where we can run a camera through your sewer to determine that the condition of it and all the sewage is going to leave your house. Very important. <coughs> um, chimney inspections where we can run a camera up a chimney. So if you have a fireplace, we, we can go through that and make sure that the fireplace is safe to operate. Um, then we have some kind of very specific things where people will call us, not so much during a home inspection, but they may live in their house um, determine that they have some problems with moisture uh, so they'll call us to come in and do either thermal imaging where we can kind of track down where the moisture problems may be in their house um, which is trying to think that's probably the the main services that we do there's little bits of other other things that we can provide um, whether you would use our company or any home inspection company in Illinois home inspectors have to be licensed so you should be asking the home inspection company that you're talking with uh, for a copy of their license or proof of licensure. Um, as far as the tools that they carry, most are going to have all the normal things, ladders, flashlights, that kind of stuff. But you should probably be asking, do they have other tools to check for gas leaks? Can they test for carbon monoxide? Can they test for moisture? So moisture meters to, to look in your basement or in the attic, things like that. Mm -hmm. A typical inspection, and I'm going to talk really here about a single family home. So um, a condominium may be a little bit simpler because the scope of the inspection tends to be a little bit smaller. But in a single family home, typically two to three hours to go through the inspection. Um, and it's gonna be kind of top to bottom. It will include the roof, it will include the attic, all of the structure in the home, <coughs> excuse me, all the structure in the home, all of the mechanical system. So the heating, the air conditioning, uh, electrical system, 
um, the structure in the basement, if, there, if the home has a basement or crawl space, we're going to be looking in there to make sure that you don't have any sort of uh, water entry problems or structural issues. Uh, a question that does come up periodically is would a home inspection include a termite inspection? So Evanston, we've done inspections over the years, uh, a lot of them in Evanston, and there are some homes in some areas in Evanston that have termite inspections. We do not, as a company, provide termite inspections. That's a specialty. Um, there's some debate in the industry whether a termite inspection has to be done by a licensed person or not. I'm of the belief that you do. You need to be what's called a licensed pest control operator. Um, there are other people that say a home inspector can, can do a termite inspection. Um, we've chosen to stay out of it. We are not even insured to do uh, termite inspections. So that's something that we like to get across to people uh, on the front end. Um, in addition to all the other items we were talking about, a typical home inspection would probably include uh, testing appliances, um, laundry kitchen, that kind of stuff, and then of course going through room by room checking windows, doors, floors, ceilings, uh, electrical outlets, that type of stuff. So it, the process, as I said, is probably a two to three hour process to go through the home. Some inspection companies can provide a written report to you right on the spot. Uh, we tend to choose to, to basically spend that time gathering information, looking at the home, and then we'll write a report for you afterwards, and that typically gets emailed off. Um, the, uh, the, the home inspection process, so I, this is my, personally, my 34th year doing inspections. Um, our company's been around for 43 years now. Um, when I first started, home inspections were really, um, for people to, to learn about their house, basically make a decision, did I want to buy or did I not want to buy? It has somehow or another in, evolved into, people will get a home inspection and will try to negotiate the, the cost of the home. That's a fairly common thing. I would be very cautious on that. That is not the intent of a home inspection. We are not there to help you uh, cut a deal uh, on the price of the home, then get a home inspection and cut a better deal. That is not what things are intended for. Uh, if there are you know, major problems, the roof has a leak, that's the kind of stuff you can sometimes ask a seller to fix, but I would definitely defer to a real estate agent to determine what are the negotiable things. So really don't, don't think of a home inspection as being uh, negotiating tool. The other problem or the other issue that I would say is home inspections are typically not including warranties. So if you're looking for a warranty or a guarantee, uh, there are companies that can provide a, a warranty. So a typical one would be appliances. Um, the length of the duration of the warranty is typically a year. So if you move in and you find that uh, the dishwasher breaks after six months, if you have a warranty, that can be can be taken care of by the warranty company. So uh, again, be cautious that a home inspection is not a warranty. Um, as far as the, the follow-up after the home inspection, I alluded earlier to the fact that a written report is, is gonna be sent to you. That's a requirement. In Illinois, we have to be licensed. Part of the licensure is that we have to provide a written report. There is no such thing as a verbal report with home inspection. So um, a, a, a normal home inspection report, these days anyways, is gonna be typed, uh, computer generated, uh, probably is gonna include, include a fair amount of photographs of deficiencies, uh, sometimes video of things that we have found. Uh, a lot of times there will be links to other areas where you can do a little bit further investigation uh, to, to learn more about the problem that we've described. So. Um, that, that is kind of the normal process. Um, you should, because of the, the timing on the real estate transaction, things get done pretty quickly. So if you make an offer on a house, you want to call a home inspector as fast as you can to get it scheduled. The, the normal contract, you guys tell me if I'm wrong, is normally five days to get the home inspection and the attorney's approval done. So you need to get that stuff lined up pretty quickly. Uh, the home inspection report then is typically going to be provided to you within two business days. So you'll get that pretty quickly. Yeah? Quick, quick question. For someone who's a newbie in the home search process, when they walk into a home, what they're looking at, they usually are taken by the aesthetics. Yep. What should they do when they're just overwhelmed by the looks and the superficial aspects of a home? What should they really zero in on to make sure it's something they want to pursue? 
I would say the, the hot buttons, when we schedule appointments, we ask people what are your concerns, the hot buttons are always something water related. Mm -hmm. So I would look very carefully and, and frankly smell the home. When you get in the basement, does it smell musty? Do you see stains in the basement? Do you see stains on walls in the basement? So I would be first and foremost looking for water related things. Some of it you're not going to be able to tell. The seller maybe it doesn't have a problem. Sometimes the seller has covered things up. Um, there's a lot of issues that you can run into, but I would say anything uh, water related is usually a hot button for people. Like, so. Like what you said about seller covering it up. It yeah. Happening. I mean, we had an experience that um, with us, apparently there were three, you know, two claims on sewer backup yep. against our house. I mean, against the insurance company for the house, and they never disclosed that. Yeah. But, and, and that's, you know, actually, that's important because usually when you buy a home, you want to acquire, uh, or at least get a quote. I mean, you have to acquire mortgage, I'm sorry, not mortgage insurance, homeowner's insurance, you know, in case there's like a flood, a fire, a burglary. When you get a quote, most of the companies are going to run a search on previous claims, because that's going to affect your policy. Yep. That is where they find out if there are any previous claims, just like I said, sewer backup. That's something, you know, to know. And you, that's what we tell you get the quote right away once you go on the contract. And give you some idea of what's going on in the background. Yeah, I would agree. Um, you know, one of the questions that comes up often is what, sort of related to what you asked, is you know what would cause somebody to rethink after the inspection, to kind of rethink, should is this a place that I really want to purchase? Um, structural issues are a problem. So if the home inspector comes in and he or she finds uh, structural problems. Um, like major structural problems, that's the kind of stuff I would think twice about. And you may need to call a contractor, or sometimes people will actually go and call a structural engineer or some, an architect to really evaluate this stuff. That, in my view, is kind of a nuclear option. Um, structural engineers and architects are not cheap. So you're not going to have somebody come out for $200 to evaluate your foundation. If it's a structural engineer, it's going to be probably $1,000 just right off the bat to come in and look at it. So. I have a question. Yeah. Because most times, I mean, I understand all of the additional costs and everything. Is there a way for the homeowner? So basically, these guys that go out, or sorry, I guess go out and they take a look at the home. Is there a way for the homeowners to kind of like just eyeball and try and find out these issues? I mean, you know that yeah. if, if there's water damage, that's obvious. I mean, I can see water leaking over here, and the, and the smell, what you said, yeah, that, that's yeah. obvious. But really, more kind of like, walk around the outside the house and they see like cracks in foundation, stuff like that. Is there a way more tangible for the home buyer? Um, if they're experienced, yes. Mm -hmm. If they're overwhelmed with the process and they're just struggling to kind of keep their head above water and, and you know, it's just a place I really want to purchase, it can get pretty difficult. It, it gets overwhelming. Um, the one thing I would say in response to that is look to see sort of the lay of the land. Is this property in a low area where water is gonna, gonna come towards the house? The Chicago area is a very flat area, so you're not gonna run into too many houses that are sitting at the top of the hill. But there are sometimes very little nuances in the neighborhood. Uh, if you happen to get to the house or can, can get into the neighborhood when it's raining, find out where water drains away from that house. If it is all running towards that house, I would be looking very carefully inside that house to see what's going on. I was yes. ask you about soil. Yeah. Would soil be a factor in that as, as you walk around the, uh, the property? It, it can. Um, unfortunately, all, the only soil you're really going to be able to look at is what's exposed. So you're not going to be able to tell soil, if, if this is your question, soil conditions below grade, if it's clay or drainable rock or gravel or something like that. That's, that's certainly something that would be a good thing. But I would say in most instances, you're not going to be able to tell that. So um, back to your other question. Is there something that uh, a home buyer can look? If, if you are looking at a home that has had a, an addition or some sort of remodeling, like a flip is a pretty common thing these days, um, I would absolutely be going to the village or city that that house is located in and I would be checking to see were permits pulled for that work. So a real trick that people do is they'll, they'll take a permit out to do window replacement and they'll do a full remodel, kitchen, floors, heating, electric, the whole bit, but it's windows is what the permit is for. So you want to make sure, did the city permit the work that was done there, or did the contractor permit it? And secondly, did it get inspected by the city? Because the city is going to be able to look 
at this stuff during uh, construction or during remodeling and with walls opened up and find out is there is the the mechanical stuff mechanical systems are they installed properly a home inspection everything's covered we can't come in I mean, we can sometimes find problems but um, permits are super important we really recommend that stuff on a regular basis so one of the other things that comes up with home inspections frequently is how much is something going to cost um, we have chosen to stay out of uh, determining costs because it, it can be all over the place. A house in Knollwood could be one price, a house in Chicago could be a much lower or higher price depending on where it's at. So we have chosen to stay out of it. Although there are some services that can take a home inspection report and they can, all the defects, if you've got a list of 10 different problems, they can put together pricing that is zip code specific for what those repairs are. So in our reports, we, we put a link to it. Uh, right off the top of my head, I can give you some names. Yeah, if, yeah, if you don't mind sharing. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you two names right off the bat. Repairpricer.com is a service. Uh, this is all done online. Repairpricer.com, and the other is a, a company called Major Domo, M-A-J-O-R-D-O-M-O.com. And both of those can take a home inspection report and, and produce bids for you. Um, they're not, bids is not right, produce costs. These are not bids for the actual repair work. In, in a perfect scenario, you would always have a contractor come in and that contractor would look at your specific issues and be able to put pricing together. But these are pretty good shortcuts for you. They cost anywhere from, I think it's like $89 on the low end to about $150. If I were <coughs> purchasing a house, that's something I would absolutely be going for with the home inspection. The second one's Major Domo. Majordomo.com. The last thing I would leave you with, I mean, we're obviously in the home inspection business and we would love to do inspections for everybody. Um, if there was one other service that I would absolutely do when I'm buying a home, I would have a sewer survey. Um, we have a website, sewersurvey.com, that links right to our website. Uh, if you're buying a single family home or a townhouse, you want that done. You want a camera to go out through that sewer to determine what the condition is underground. It is incredible some of the different things we've seen during inspection. So uh, if you, when you put it in perspective, if you had to replace a sewer on a typical home, it could be anywhere from fifteen dollars to $20,000. Uh, and it could be more if it's a longer sewer so, or deeper. So uh, that's, you know, we charge $350 to provide that service. Um, pretty good investment, I would say. So that's the main stuff I had. Um, yeah. I'm happy to answer questions. What, yeah, what other questions might, by the, I cannot speak anymore. What other questions might you have uh, for Mr. Johnson? Do you, do you do the moisture thingy with that little Moisture detector? Yeah, so we have a couple different ways we can check for moisture. Um, moisture meters, so if we see a stain, all of our inspectors carry a moisture meter where they can actually probe into the wall and right. determine is it wet. Mm -hmm. And then we have thermal imaging equipment right, that right, is, that's what is helpful. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, I, I'm very cautious when I explain to people what thermal imaging is. Um, it is not a moisture meter. It is, in really simple terms, it's a temperature picture. But if we are looking in this room and we see a cold spot up there, that could be an indicator of moisture, then we would want to go with our moisture meter and probe into the wall to determine is it actually uh, wet. So uh, yeah, that, that's kind of standard equipment these right. days in the home inspection yeah. business. Yeah. Thank you guys. I have a question. Uh, hey everybody. Uh, you mentioned the, the moisture meter, thermal meters. What about, um, do home inspection services provide readings on like air leaks as it relates to insulation around heating or cooling? Generally not. What you're getting into there is uh, blower door testing where they you will install a, a blower door it's called what's a fan that will put a negative pressure on the home and they'll try to suck air in and that will identify they'll use some of the equipment that we would use but they're going to uh, put a negative pressure and they're going to determine where air leaks are around like you said doors and windows. Um, the, the U.S. Department of Energy a couple of years ago did put together a thing called a home energy score. Um, I'm a little skeptical about it, I have to admit. I, I did the testing for it and I actually became a, uh, it was called a certified energy uh, rater. Uh, I never did one. Um, we just, nobody was particularly interested in it, frankly. 
Um, so the answer to your question is a typical home inspection would not include blower door testing. The thermal imaging, if the, the conditions are right, may be very helpful on determining where you may have air leaks. But if you're really looking for energy efficient, efficiency, you want to talk to somebody that specializes in that. Is there yes. anything you'd like to say about that unsung area? Sure. Um, so I would say some of the common misconceptions are that if your house does not have a basement, then you don't have to test for radon or you're not at risk for having radon. Um, and that just simply is not the case. Um, Radon is a soil gas, so it uh, comes up through the ground and can um, just diffuse into your home from any small cracks, um, any plumbing insects, anywhere that there's um, small openings. So yes, it is a concern when you have a basement, um, but it's almost more concerning when you have a slab as opposed to an unfinished basement that you may not be spending a lot of time in. Um, so I would say definitely test. Um, I think everybody should test. I feel like homeowners should test as well. Um, there have been plenty of times where we'll go to do a test and a seller will say, oh, you know, we've lived here for 30 years. I don't think that there's gonna be a problem. Um, and then the levels come up high and it's just kind of unfortunate to know that this family has been living in a home for X amount of years and just wasn't educated enough to test. <clears throat> um, the EPA action level for radon is a 4.0. Um, and another thing that we try to get across to people is they'll ask if we passed or failed the radon test, if it's positive or negative results. Um, there will always be some level of radon in almost any home just based on the conditions um, that we have in our minerals and our, and our soil. Um, so it really is up to you what level you're comfortable living with. Um, the mitigation level is 4.0, as long as you can get it below that. Um, the EPA says it's no longer a concern, but um, yeah, I would say just be aware and educate yourself. Besides the slab that you were speaking of for radar yeah. testing, I mean, location be a part of it. An example would be Crystal Lake. Crystal Lake had a quarry, so I could imagine with that quarry and that amount of uh, that amount of rock formation, mm -hmm. that the neighboring communities would be affected by radon. So um, radon comes from the breakdown of uranium. So um, the one thing that they do say is new construction homes do have a little bit of a higher tendency, just because all of that soil has just been jostled up. It's a lot easier for the gases to move through. Um, homes that have been in their space for quite some time and have settled and compacted the soil have less of a risk factor just because it's so compacted, it's harder for that gas to move through. Um, so I don't know if a quarry specifically would, would be an issue. Um, since it is based on the uranium deposits, it's kind of impossible to determine you know, where those are going to be. Um, but they do have a lot of data now where you can look up the average concentration by zip code. By zip code, yeah. yeah. If I can jump in here, I, just from a practical standpoint, I've noticed over the years that we tend to find more elevated, I'm not going to say high levels, more elevated levels along rivers. So kind of an odd thing. I just, while Jenna was talking, I jumped in. I have this as a, a shortcut on my bookmarks. Um, and it's a big long HTML, but I typed in IEMA, I-E-M-A, radon map. And IEMA stands for the Illinois Emergency Management Association who oversees our license to do radon testing. Uh, and the first thing I came up with, it popped up a map. And there's an interactive map. You can go zip code by zip code, as Jenna said, and I think it even goes county by county. Um, so if you're in um, Glenview is 60025. You can type in 60025. They will tell you the number of radon tests that have been done there and the number that have come up, come out above the action level. Yeah, they'll give so, you that percentage yep. of what homes in that zip code have tested above the action level. So you can check level. all that stuff. All right. yeah. you, you can't say the straight answer to your question is you can't say Crystal Lake has a radon problem in every house. It's just that's not, it's not that simple. Right. So, okay. Other questions? She asked the one I wanted to ask already. So. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, the last thing I'll leave you all with, um, so uh, coupon for you guys, uh, we are offering a half off on sewer. So we, I said earlier, we charge $350 for a sewer survey. Uh, I'm going to give all the attendees. So for you guys on Zoom, you chickens that couldn't come here and be live, you don't get a coupon. Although I'll leave, I'll leave coupons for you if you like. I was about to say, you can email you. We'll, we'll send them to you. Um, but there's a, a coupon here for half off on a sewer survey. So if you, and it would be with a home inspection. So I'll leave that behind for you. So thanks for listening. I appreciate it. This was was fun. Hope you got some info. My name is Michael Walsh. I'm a certified residential appraiser in the state of Illinois. I'll give you a little background on where appraisers come from and who regulates them and why we have them to start with. Generally speaking, the appraisal community has grown after economic disasters in the United States. The collapse in 1929 uh, brought, you know, people aware of that they needed to have trained professionals that could analyze portfolios of real estate for lending purposes. And then throughout the years, you've had different other banking collapses. Each one of them have contributed to the growth of the appraisal industry. Now at the beginning, what they had, appraisals weren't regulated, you had professional organizations that their members subscribed to a particular way of doing business and particular ethics and to become a member of one of these professional organizations was the controlling factor. Uh, after collapse of the banking industry in the 80s and the 90s, the federal government decided that they needed to step in. And the federal government did not really want to regulate the appraisers. They didn't want to be in charge of it. They wanted the states to go ahead and do it. But they wanted the appraisers to be licensed and certified. And they wanted more professionalism. So what happened was that a group of professional organizations, the FHA, the VA, uh, and the Appraisal Institute of Canada all got together and they started what was called the Appraisal Foundation, which was a non-for-profit organization. And they wrote a document called, we call it USPAP. It's the Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice. And that's what governs, that governs everything. Everybody, you know, behaves to what USPAP states. And then the individual states decided to license everybody. And here in the state of Illinois, we have three types of licensing. The first one, which was an entry level license, which is just called a license, is really a trainee's license. A trainee appraiser cannot you know, sign a report on his own. He can't work on his own. He has to work underneath a certified appraiser. And uh, it's very easy to get a trainee's license. You, all you got to do is take some classes and give the state of Illinois a $500 check, and they don't even test you anymore. So trainee's license is not the big thing. To be certified, now certification, there's two different types of certification. There's certified residential, which allows people to do properties that are one to four family properties and then there's what's called certified general a certified general can appraise the woodfield mall okay it's a commercial he's a commercial appraiser uh, generally speaking general appraisers don't do mortgages type of thing so as we say mortgages mortgages are only one of the segments that we perform appraisals for anytime a value is needed Okay, an appraiser is called if they need a professional opinion of value. My own practice revolves around, I have a very diversified practice that I do appraisals for divorce purposes, bankruptcies, tax appeals, the zoning board of appeals. I also do residential mortgages. Why I decided to diversify my practice is this is real estate 
And as you know, real estate has many ups and downs. Right now, the residential lending market is in a downturn, okay? Very little going on. My business, when it comes down to estate work, divorce work, tax appeals, we're busy all the time. So that's how that goes. So move, moving on into, you had brought up with an appraisal report here. Let me talk about where the, these come from. We're talking now lending. This is a lending form. This particular form, the 1004, we also call it the URAR, Universal Residential Appraisal Report form. Okay, now this is a specific form. They all use it for lending purposes unless they're lending their own money. Now, if you're lending your own money, you can do what you want, okay? But when you're lending other people's money, there's particular ways of doing things. Now, this was designed by Fannie Mae, the Federal National Mortgage Association. You all know Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. They designed this form for their purposes. It's read by a computer and it goes into their back end systems. So when you go to the bank, you, after you've signed a contract, you bought your home, you go talk to the loan officer and he's going to take a mortgage application and accept an appraisal fee, then what they are going to do is they're then going to order an appraisal from somebody that's on their network, okay, maybe through another third party management company, maybe from their panel of appraisers that work with that particular lender. And they're going to ask for if it's a detached single family home. Well, it's this form, the URAR. There's another form for condominiums, which is kind of similar. And there's another one for two to four unit properties, which is different because it takes into account income okay income and vacancy and you know it's a income producing piece of property so i don't know what all questions you know you had highlighted in here but it really comes down to that at the beginning they're going to define where the property is what it is what's its legal description okay what's its pin number what how much taxes there are okay that's what's going on at the beginning. Then we get again to a contract analysis. The appraiser will look at the contract. What was the purchase price? You know, who the buyer and seller was? Uh, you know, is there any concessions that are being given as well? All of that will be reported. Can I get the question? Sure. Mm -hmm. Tell us how location heavily impacts the results of the appraisal. Well, the location is, we want to say, is the, is the, is the bedrock of where this, this starts as you jump into the next uh, section, which is neighborhood, okay? Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac want to know what neighborhood this house is in, what the boundaries are of that neighborhood, okay, and what is its makeup, right? Is it predominantly single family? Is it a mixture of single family condominiums? two to four unit properties? Is it a mixture? Is it, you know, predominantly rental buildings? They want to know this for, again, for decision making purposes. What would be the most favorable of all those categories? Oh, the most favorable would be that it's heavily owner occupied. They don't like the fact that they're in an area that would have an extreme amount of renters. Okay. Why? That would be more risk, okay? And that's what they're using this for, is to analyze what's the risk in this particular piece of property. So to start with, your def with location was your question, you're going to define that here. The subject is located in this neighborhood. Now they've asked for the boundaries. We now going to be look when we're looking for comparables, where do you think they're coming from? They're coming from the subject neighborhood, unless 
there's no comparables existing in the subject neighborhood. And then you have to go outside of the neighborhood boundaries. Well, anytime you'd be going outside of the neighborhood boundaries, you would expect that you're going to get questions about that and you're going to want to have a reason why you did these things. So <laughs> neighborhood is the bedrock. I, I have a question. Sure. If we take a look at the, at the grid over here. So you see at the bottom I highlighted modernization, upgrades, quality. How do you come up with those adjustments? Because you know one of them was good gets deducted 20,000 and have the average. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm in neighborhood section. Where are you? At the bottom over here. This one is the second page. Okay, well. Uh-huh. You said the bottom one that where I highlighted the upgrade quality. So okay. the subject is good average. Then we have comp one is good. So we got a negative 20. And then the third one, we have average, we got a plus 20. How, how do you come up with that specific, with the number? Specifically? Yeah. That's the appraiser's job. He's going to come up with that based upon what he's seen. seen uh, you know, obviously he looked at this particular property and how it relates to the subject. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, is that property, now this property is superior. Now there's, there's several ways here that quality and condition are handled. This guy here is doing it, he's doing it twice. If you look further up in the middle of your grid, and I don't like skipping around, uh, you know, in all this, but you have what is called quality quality of construction, okay, the quality of construction, these are all Q3, so they're all similar construction quality. And then he's got condition, there's C3. Well, let me give you like the, the way that that kind of breaks down a little bit. A C1 is a brand new construction home, never been lived in before. A C2, would be one that's a freshly rehabbed house. Okay, that this one, it might look almost new, but it's a hundred year old house and you know, everything has been redone. That hundred year old house can never become a C1. Okay, just can't do it. Then you have C3. C3 is a well-maintained home. Okay, so he's saying in here that these are all well-maintained homes it's been modernized. Then C4 would have obvious problems. C5 would have major problems. C6 would not be habitable. Okay. So now this guy here on this appraisal, he has said, well, all of these are similar in quality and condition, but for some reason, some of them are more similar or more, more, you know, this one's superior. Okay, maybe it has a completely modernized kitchen, but it's not enough to call it a C2. You follow what I'm saying? Yep. Okay, because all it had was a, mod, you know, a modernized kitchen. Maybe it was only baths or something. So, yeah, and where these came up with that, that's his determination. Really intriguing to me. That's subjective. It's that's, subjective, so it's of course. A, it, it's an art versus a science. It's subjective. Well, some might say that you could have made a different adjust, adjustment going to have an appraisal value. Mm -hmm. So. So that's kind of really uh, what I'd love for you to speak to your person of extreme experience. How do you come up with those gray areas and kind of make them make sense to you? Yeah, you know, a lot. Of, you can, you can base it off of what others. You know, you can look at other comparables. What is happening? Mm -hmm. You know that they are. Uh, this one has the modernized kitchen. The subject does not. Okay, there's obviously, it's inferior. The subject is inferior. 
there is a downward adjustment there somewhere. Uh, you know, you have to make a determination out of it. Is the subject in this situation the average of the neighborhood, or what is that control? No, the sub, the sub, the subject is is itself, okay. and you should be picking the comparables, picking the comparables to be that are similar to the subject property. Now, in the case of this. We're looking at that they say that the, the quality of construction is similar, the condition is similar, but there might be, you'll notice that these are not, that these are pre-printed, are not pre-printed statements that are there. Mm. This particular appraiser added that, okay, because he figured that he needed an adjustment over and above what was up here. Okay, could he have maybe taken the condition of the subject and made it a C4 and then all of these C3s? That might have worked as well. Again, I didn't appraise the property, haven't seen any one of these, so I don't know what's going through their mind. there is uh, some subjectivity involved mm -hmm. in your profession what things can sellers do to kind of improve their chances when they're getting evaluated by an appraiser are there any kind of controllable factors that they can, can work on well I mean obviously it's just like what you're doing what you're doing uh, when you're putting the house on the market mm -hmm. you want to put your best foot forward should you be a seller okay and uh, I would you know the appraiser is going to come out the appraiser generally speaking is not worried about did you pick up the dirty clothes that are on the floor they don't care about that at all okay the quality and condition of the property you know obviously that if you're coming into a uh, into a, a situation and you've got broken glass okay well broken glass is going to take you out of that c3 maybe everything else maybe everything else in the house is nicely maintained but you have broken glass if you've got broken glass it's going to throw you down into the c4 if you've got peeling and damaged paint that will do the same so if you're looking at okay i got my house sold you know, I want to have my best foot forward, but I know on my back porch, I've got all kinds of peeling and chipped and damaged paint. You know, might it be smart to, to do it up front before, you know, before the FHA comes back and forces you to do it, you see? So, uh, you know, there's little things like that. You got, you got the hand railings that are falling off and falling down. So, you see, by little things in your house, there's certain little things, just little deferred maintenance can knock you off of one of those categories. I have a question. What about a swimming pool? If you didn't have a swimming pool and you bought it, but that, I know it doesn't change the value of the house when you buy it. A pool is, uh, I forgot the term, but if you have a pool and you're appraising a house, but there wasn't one, but it's a whole new patio and deck. Okay, well, you're bouncing all over the place oh. with, 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 with all Definitely the, not trying to. I actually all authentically okay. was saying... Swimming, pool, swimming pools are, you know, if this house had a swimming pool, okay, let's just say magically this one had a pool. So now when I'd be appraising the house, one of the features that I'd be looking for in the sales comparables would be similar swimming pools, okay? And I would include that type of comparable into the grid, okay? So, you want to, these, these features, let's talk about. Features, the banks like to have them bracketed, okay? And by bracketing, I mean that if your subject is a two-bedroom home, okay, don't you show up with comparables that are all three bedrooms, because they're gonna send it back to you, okay? Now, if you're, if your uh, house is a three bedroom home, could you use a four bedroom? If you had to, could you use a two bedroom? 
Yes, you could if you, if you need to for some reason, okay? But again, and we talked just at the beginning when we were on page one, okay, that any time you step out of those boundaries that are discussed, you want to have an answer as to why you're doing this, okay? You know, bedroom count is not a real, real big thing with the exception of two bedrooms. Two bedrooms need to be compared to other two bedroom homes. Any questions? Now, in your opinion, is it better to have the best property in a less favorable area or have the least favorable property in a better area? Hmm. For, is it better for what purpose? It's for, as an investment. Okay, <laughs> as an investment? Investments are based upon a particular, a particular investor's investor requirements. Uh, I would state that you're probably better off to go for main road, okay? That if you're going into, you know, why, why go into a you know, middle of the road neighborhood and buy the only mansion that's there, okay? It's an oddball, it's always gonna be hard to appraise uh, and when you come up to sell it, people that are looking for mansions, generally speaking, you know, are not going to, where? You know, not going to just planes to look for it, you know? Right? So yeah, I would, I would go main road if I was looking for investment, but that's again, me. Because you have right? really solid opinions. Yeah, it's me. <laughs> okay, any questions, Lauren? I don't have any, this is more for the people over here. <laughs> Michelle, you have a question for us? Um, no, this is um, super informative, so thank you. Well, I guess one question is, um, in terms of, I'm sort of wrapping my head around the idea of like subject and comparables, but when you have, when you're, how much of like the non-visible things about a house goes into the appraiser's assessment. So I'm, I'm talking about like, you know, electric panels, um, things that you may, things that aren't cosmetic and that you would need more information in terms of the history of improvements about how does that go into? Well, we're back to, I want to say quality and condition. And, you know, when you're talking electrical panels, I'm going to look at it. I'm going to open it up, but I'm not an electrician. I'm not a home inspector. What I want to see is, are there wires hanging out? I mean, is there any health and safety issues? That's what we're concerned with, All right? So again, back again, the man that was here before, okay, will recommend you get a home inspection. And if you have concerns about a particular electrical panel, definitely get it. Because you don't know how many of them that I see that are amateur electric. They might not have been built that way, but over the years, they've definitely changed, you know. So, yeah, we, we try and, you know, if I'm building, a, if I'm appraising a house that was built in 1975, let's say, I'm going to be picking comparables from the neighborhood. I'm not going to be picking the comparables from the 1950s and from the year 2000. I'm going to be trying to pick comparables that are similar in age. Most of them would be similar in quality and condition as well. You know, this whole thing is if you keep everything as similar as possible, you have less adjustments to be made. You know, so will one 1975 house that is across the street have similar have similar odds and ends that needs to be done? Probably, you know, probably, you know, as opposed to, see this is when it's so important to keep everything as similar as possible. That way you don't have to worry about making unusual adjustments. You know, you can't come in and you got a 1975 house and then you start using comparables that were built in 2005. It's just ridiculous, okay? Yet, how many times do I see that come to me from agents, okay? Oh, I've got comps for you. 
you know, these things aren't. That's not a comparable. Yeah, these things aren't comparable at all. Okay, they're not comparable at all. But oh, maybe something is comparable. Like oh, it had a two-car garage, and the subject had a two-car garage. See, it's comparable. Well, no, you know, people come up with whatever they want to. Okay, when they're trying to get the house to appraise on the agent's uh, point, uh, you know, because then the reason they're coming up with, uh, with bad comps is that there aren't any good comps, you know. This is the thing, you know, it's, it's, it's tough out there, and more so today because you have less and less sales. So, you know, what you might be looking at is comparables you, that are further out or further back in time. So what's the furthest out you would use as a comp? Well, that's uh, you know unusual. You see, I mean, you got to you got to use what you got to use. So six months is pretty much your. Standard. Well, that's time. You okay, that's what I meant in time. Time, in time, time, distance. Well, again, Fan, Fanny and Freddie say they don't care about distance. They don't care about time. What they are looking for is comparables that give them a good indication of value. So now if I use a comp that's 12 months old, okay, use a comp that's 12 months old, but I've analyzed the marketplace and prices in the market are stable, what does it matter? Yeah. Okay. Now if prices are declining, and I make a, an adjustment, okay, for the declining market, then we've considered that. The whole thing is, why would I use an older comparable? It might be the exact best property. It might be a model match for the subject home. And uh, so do we just discount it because it's older, or do we consider it? Now, in an appraisal, when you're doing one of these, okay, you have to have a minimum of three closed sales. Most appraisers use a whole lot more than three closed sales. So let's say I have three closed sales within 90 days. Well, I could use as many other things as I'd like, okay? That tells, helps tell my story. So if I want to do more research, that's up to me. I, I did have a question. As I'm going through this uh, uniform residential appraisal report, I see that we went over the C, uh, for C1, a new, new structure, to C6 being a den. Uh, with, the, with the Q, it looks like it's similar, so quality three would be well maintained. Would a, how, uh, actually, no, let me rephrase that, how much would a renovation for a kitchen and bathroom increase the quality for the adjustment? For the, how much would it, see that's, that, that's, that's a tough question right there. It was just a new kitchen and bath, okay? What's the quality and cost of this kitchen and bath? Did it come from Menards or did it come from one of these North Shore uh, kitchen houses here in uh, maybe up in Winnetka that uh, you know we're looking at uh, designer I mean all different prices okay all different prices but generally speaking on its own just doing the kitchen and bathroom alone won't put the house into a C2 a C2 is like for a rehabbed house that it's more than just the kitchen and bath, okay? It might have all interior doors, it might have new flooring, it might have new central air, new, new furnace, new plumbing, new this, new that, new the other thing, you see? So it's not just the kitchen and bath, you know? But the kitchen and bath are big contributors, okay? They're big contributors. You know, I don't know, the, I, see it, I see it all the time because we do appraisals on these properties that are either subject to completion for plans and specs that we go out and here's this 
quite literally falling down shell, okay? That we get the architect's plans, we get the specifications for everything that they're, they're putting into it. So now we're not really so much considered worried about what's there now with the exception of size, okay? Because when we come back, after we appraise the property subject to completion for plans and specs, they're gonna get their loan, they're gonna go in there and they're gonna gut rehab this place. This thing will be as close to new as it possibly can, but it will still only end up as a C2. Right. Okay? okay? Got it? It's confusing, I know. <laughs> See, they just, they just came up with that about five years ago and it probably took the appraisers three years to figure it all out. Any other questions or comments? Anything you want to ask about Michelle? Hmm. No? I do have one question. Um, so recently I had a mortgage lender talking to me about how sometimes the appraisal value can vary from the listing price. Um, and so how do you kind of deal with that or figure that out or I guess help people through that if they've put in an offer on a home and it comes out appraised as either higher or lower than what that purchase price was listed at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's the purpose of the appraiser going to see that property, is to determine what the value is. The lender orders the appraisal, even though, even though the lender, you know, got the money from you, okay, when you made your application, all right, they're saying is, let's see how much this is worth. Because the lender wants to decide, are they going to make this loan? Right. Okay. And if the price is too high, they want to know that. Okay. Now, a lot of people, you know, sometimes we have people that are not very sophisticated when it comes to buying real estate. Many, many people are not very sophisticated about buying real estate because why? They only buy it very seldom. Very seldom. And... Uh, you know, I know that uh, you take somebody for an example, I don't know if you've ever been to New York City, but you know, you go to New York City and I think you can buy a little house about this big, costs you a million dollars, you know. So those people, when they come to the Chicago area, they look at it and go, how much? Why, give me two, you know, right? You know, they may overpay because their frame of reference is New York City. You know, our, uh, the same would be true if we went out to California, if we went out to Silicon Valley, we'd come away shaking our heads. Here are people buying a little three bedroom ranch on a slab, paying a million four for it. it just, it would never fly around here. So this is why the lender gets an appraiser to give them an opinion of value the lender may be in Nevada, okay? They may be anywhere, so what they're looking at is that when the appraisal report comes in, they're looking at the numbers, okay? They're all supposed to be in the same place on one of these, and this is where they're making their decision. To your point, because you, I know you said what happens if it comes higher or lower, okay? At the end of the day, the appraisal is really for the lender, not for you, not for the realtor, not for anybody else. Oh, okay. So, because we're going to make sure that if you buy a home for 200000 you're putting 20% down. Right. We're going to make sure that we are only lending 80% of it. So, okay. if the appraiser, and, and at the end of the day, we're going to lend bids based on the lowest of the two. The okay. lowest of the two. Appraisal comes in at 300 we don't care. I mean, you can dance and jump and you're know, really happy, but we don't really care. Okay. Only becomes an issue if it comes in at 190. Mm -hmm. And then what we need to do is start doing the, and a lot of people talk about it, it's kind of like a buzzword, which is called, it, it's called the appraisal gap yes. strategy. Okay. Mainly because Kelly can attest to it. Do we have a lot of bidding wars right now? There are quite a few. Okay, meaning the 200 that you, you might see the place and it's, and it's listed for 200. Right. But because you have three, four other people that bidding it higher, you might end up setting at 250. Right. If we come at too higher, at 200, you have an issue. 
what we can do is try and keep the loan amount as is, meaning putting less money down, trying mm -hmm. to put more interest. There are different strategies. At the end of the day, what you want to happen is for the appraisal to come in at purchase price. Right. That's it. I have a lot of people that tell me, oh, we bought it for 200 and the appraisal came in at 200. That's not, that's nothing wrong with that. We right. thought it was to come in higher. For what? You know, it, it, it doesn't really matter. You know? Okay. Yeah. That, that's good. To and frame it's, it's independent. Way, that, the lender sure. is in one silo, the appraiser yeah. is completely independent, and ideally, you do want to just confirm the value that you paid. Okay. So if you do get more, then that's just gravy, extra equity that you've already earned. It just, just, make, it just makes the buyer yeah. feel and, and, good. And, 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 and Kelly said good. the right thing. We're silos. I don't know what he's doing. He doesn't know what I'm doing because we're right. supposed to be 100% independent. independent. We don't have communication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. I like how you said the appraisal information is not necessarily for the person buying the house. I feel like a lot of people put a lot of weight into that and so knowing that it is mostly kind of behind the scenes just kind of fact checking and verifying is honestly a very helpful way to the, gen the general public believes that the appraiser you know in protecting the lender is also protecting them and that may be somehow true however it's not. they're really there okay. to protect the lender that's the, that's the purpose of, of that. Okay. And in you the know. event the appraisal comes in lower than what you offered, right. that's when you can go to the negotiation table, make up the deficit between both parties, okay. or the deal can actually be broken at that point because in the contract it says if the, if it does, if the appraisal does not come in at value, you have the right to exit the deal. Amazing. Right? Okay, that was a perfect answer. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, well. Long, a long answer, a long answer for a short time. That's wonderful. No, I appreciate this so much, Mr. Walsh. Before we lose this valuable asset, any last questions? Video people? No questions, just thank you so much for the session. It was super awesome. educational. Thank awesome. you. Hey, it looks like we're almost out of time. So before, yeah. we, yeah. before <laughs> we lose you, Michelle, thank you so much for joining us. Well, I have your information over here. We'll enter you to the raffle. With the other awesome. guests we have over here. Great. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Monique. Good. Will do. Thanks, Kelly. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Kelly Rodman. Thank you so much for working with me. I'm a residential specialist, and I can't wait to get started on your real estate journey.